Well, this morning, as, as we're turning to the book of Acts, we're in many ways coming to a significant transition in the book of Acts. What, what I mean by this is up until this point, Luke has been focused on, on, the, on the rapid growth of the church in Jerusalem. It's, it's founding and it's growth. It's growing like wildfire. But, but, but from, from this point forward in the narrative, things begin to change. Things begin to change from here on forward because he, he transitions to the surprisingly counterintuitive way in which the gospel continues to grow like wildfire across the ancient world. It's surprising, it's different, there's challenges. And in each case, God does incredible things. Yet before we get there, let's just kind of place ourselves for a moment, maybe in the early church, two days before Stephen's death. Two days. Just just imagine for a moment that you're a member of the early church in Jerusalem, and you're growing in your love for Jesus Christ. You're growing, you're, you're hearing more about what it really means to be in Christ, what he's done. What, what does it mean to be a Christian? And, and you're growing also in your love for your fellow church members as you meet house to house with them virtually every night of the week. You're growing. Yet on this night, as you're sharing a meal together with your local home group, somebody says, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great to see more people come to faith in Jesus? Wouldn't it be great? Maybe we should talk to the apostles. Like, I had this idea. I had this idea. Why don't we talk to the apostles and see if we can set up this this week-long series of, of preaching events in the temple? And we can break up and we can go to all the surrounding towns and we'll invite everybody in the surrounding towns to come to the temple and hear Peter preach. I mean, it's a perfect time. I mean, his popularity is soaring and everybody is more than eager to listen to his teaching and the, and the teaching of the other apostles be because their miracles are constantly proving that they're ministering in the power of God. I mean, I mean, just look around. We have more than enough people in all of our home groups to do this. Just think of all the towns we could cover one day. In fact, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if Peter could bring more people to the temple in his preaching than the Feast of Passover itself. Okay, hypothetical, right? It sounds pretty good. In fact, the plan sounds kind of like a familiar plan we might hear today, right? I mean, I mean, after all, they have a celebrity preacher. They have a well-known platform. They have a program and a plan to get people out. And even better, and most importantly, they're not trying to make a name for themselves. They really want to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Perfect motives. Yet the hypothetical plan comes crashing to the ground the moment Stephen is murdered, doesn't it? The moment Stephen's murdered, everything changes. It unleashes a a tsunami of merciless persecution that scatters the early church like dust in the wind from Jerusalem to, to Judea all the way out to Samaria. And it does it in a matter of days. But in the providence of God, this scattering produces the most amazing result. Gospel success in regions that have never heard the gospel. That's what we see. So as we turn turn to our text in Acts chapter eight today, I want to let you know up front that we're going to be spending two weeks in this, in this passage because in many ways there's two important questions that, that flow from these verses. The first we're taking on today, it has to do with how Simon the magician responds to the Holy Spirit. That's going to be our key focus today. And, and the second, next week, has to do with what we might call the surprising delay 
of the Holy Spirit. That the first question has to do with a warning. And it's a warning of understanding that, that, that gospel success isn't always what we think it is in the moment. And the second is in many ways, as we look at the Holy Spirit's delay and understanding what's really going on in the text, can give us some clarification and comfort about the operation of the Holy Spirit and the gospel itself in our lives today. So this week and next week, in this text, two different focuses. So let's turn. Let's turn to the persecution that begins everything in verse one. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, we're not gonna take a lot of time in these verses, but let me highlight just a few things. From a human perspective, if we just stop reading at verse three, it looks like the chief priests and the Sanhedrin have won the day. In fact, for countless Christians, they probably feel like that. Like, like what's going on? I mean, I mean, Saul is systematically destroying the network of home fellowship groups that comprise the church, dragging as many Christians as he can off to jail. And as a result, the church is not only driven out of the temple precincts, but they're virtually eradicated from the city. Except for the apostles and a small group of believers holding on in the city of Jerusalem. From a human perspective, it might have looked like Christianity was even proven to be false. Remember Gamaliel's warning in Acts chapter five? He had that warning, he said, you know, don't mess with them right away. We wanna see if this is from God or if it's not from God. If it's from God, you can't stop it, but if it's not from God, it'll fall apart. And then he gives some examples, right? Remember what happened to the followers of Theodos? They were dispersed and they came to nothing. Remember what happened to the followers of Judas the Galilean? They were scattered and they came to nothing. His examples. And what's happening in Acts chapter 1-8, and listen to the words that are used. The church was what? Scattered. For all practical purposes, in the moment, it looks like Christianity is following in the patterns of failures past. A leader has died, and everybody is scattered to the wind. Yet in the providence of God, and that's key, in the providence of God, this persecution and dispersion produced the most unexpected result, doesn't it? Widespread evangelism in regions where the gospel has not yet been proclaimed. That's what it produces. And this because God is actively in and empowering its advance as we're gonna see as we go further on in the text. So let's go to verse four. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him. And they saw signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And what's the result? So there was great joy in the city. Now as we turn to this section, it's, it's kind of interesting that, that almost all of our Bibles, if they have headings in them, right about here they say something like Philip proclaims Christ in Samaria, Philip evangelizes Samaria, but the focus is on Philip, and, and it's rightly on Philip, because he is the primary actor through here. But, but these titles and this focus on Philip can unintentionally blind us to the stunning content of verse four before we get to Philip. 
I, I was caught by that this, this week as I was preparing. Quickly going to Philip and realizing there was something to be seen in verse four. Now those who were scattered, who were scattered? The church was scattered. How much of the church? Virtually all the church. Those who were scattered, what did they do? They went about preaching the word. We don't want to miss this. See, see, Luke is going from, from general to specific. General, the whole church, specific to Philip. But let's focus on this, this general movement among God's people as they're pressed out in this persecution. What's the unifying attribute? They're not cowering in fear. They're, they're, they're not locked in abject depression. They're, they're not forsaking Christ. No. The common trait that marks these believers as they're pushed out of Jerusalem is their persistent and fervent evangelism. Pretty counterintuitive, wouldn't you think? And what's even more surprising is that they're declaring it in the most positive terms. What I mean by that is that the Greek verb behind the word preaching here in our text is is to bring, announce, or proclaim good news. It's that Greek word we get gospel from. They're preaching the good news of the word. It's good news. We got kicked out of Jerusalem. Stephen got murdered. Let me show you the good news, right? The good news that got us here, but it's good news. These people have lost virtually everything. What they can carry is about all they have. But there's one thing that they haven't lost. They haven't lost their passion to see all people come to faith in Jesus Christ. And this is all the more amazing. When you realize that these Christians are not proclaiming the gospel from a position of social prominence or political power. They're not in a favored position anymore. And often, what do we think that we need to share the gospel? We think that we need to be in a position that's going to cause people to listen to us. And often we think it's because of power or prominence or influence. But what are these people? They're wanted criminals running away from the religious law. It helps us realign our understanding of what it means to be a Christian and how evangelism actually works. Now, now I have to be honest that this verse is in many ways, it's, it's a passing line in a much broader story, but it's a powerful line given the circumstances. Because in it, I, I think that we see kind of this, a, a quiet transition in the life of the early church. We see a quiet transition. The, the pattern of evangelism, at least it's being recorded, is shifting, and I'm not trying to indicate that nobody ever shared the gospel in Jerusalem, and that it was only Peter. Not, not saying that, but what we see is that there's an embrace of, of the need to share by each individual in a way that we don't witness in Jerusalem or at least that Luke doesn't record. What I mean by this is the predominant pattern in Jerusalem seems to be come and see. Come and see Peter. Come and see the apostles. Preach in the temple. But what happens when persecution strikes? The pattern of evangelism becomes an everyday pattern of go and tell people the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever you happen to be. It's from come and see to go and tell. And I want to highlight this because many of us have grown up, if you're a Christian, you've grown up in come and see churches. You've grown up in come and see churches. Come and hear churches. Come, come to the church and hear my pastor, hear an evangelist, hear, hear a celebrity Christian, maybe Tim Tebow. Share the gospel. Come to church. Come to VBS. Hear the gospel. Come to our big youth event and hear the gospel. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not against these events. So, so just, just in case you're getting a little excited, I'm not invite, against inviting our friends and relatives to church. 
please do it constantly. But here's the problem. In many cases, we've come to believe that gospel success requires a big program and a smooth celebrity speaker. We've come to believe that the method is what's going to make it happen. Yet what we see in our text today is is that we need so much more than a professional and a platform and a program. We need everyday Christians. Everyday Christians who are so gripped with their privileges in the gospel of Jesus Christ that they can't help but share the good news with everybody that they meet. So don't hear me saying one or the other, I'm saying both and. And as Luke transitions from the general witness in verse four of the church that's being pushed out to the particular ministry of Philip in the following verses, where does Philip just happen to be? Where does he just, he just happens to be in one of the most despised cities in the ancient world if you are a Jew, and that is the city of Samaria. That's where he's at. He's in one of the most despised cities in the ancient world for a Jew. See, see, here's the deal. Jews didn't just happen to visit the city of Samaria. When we lived in Kodiak, we always joked with people. It's like, it's like nobody just happens to be stopping through Kodiak and figures they're going to say hi for a visit. You know, like, oh, I was just visiting the island. Doesn't happen. It's an end destination. It's, it's not something in between. But much more when it came to Samaria. The Jews did everything they possibly could to avoid the entire territory of Samaria. Now, I mean, not go through it. They'd go around it. They'd take extra days going from the north to the south in Galilee down to Judea in the south. Because the, the bitterness between these two people was a bitterness that went back for a thousand years. It, it actually goes back a thousand years. That's where it begins. The conflict begins all the way back at the death of Solomon. That's where it begins. The 10 northern tribes of Israel decide they want to go their own way. They want to form their own nation. So now the kingdom gets divided. There's Israel in the north and Judea in the south. 10 tribes north, two tribes south. But it wasn't really this, this nice pleasant split. Most splits aren't, right? No, the kingdom in the north spent the next 300 years pretty much at war with their cousins to the south. They're the same people, but they're at war. We, we advanced to 722 BC. The king of Assyria conquers the northern kingdom as judgment from God himself. Countless thousands of its people are deported from the land. So, so, so northern kingdom, Jews in the northern kingdom, most of them, not all of them, departed. And the king of Assyria then backfills in by bringing in all sorts of other Gentile people from other nations. So what's left is a small group of Jews, a large group of Gentiles, and over time, what happens? These Israelites don't remain separate as God calls them to. They intermarry, and this is a religious issue, not a not a ethnic issue. In direct obedience, disobedience to God's commands. And it only gets worse. The long-standing animosity metastasizes into all-out hatred in the fourth century. Because it's in the fourth century that the Samaritans made an official break away from their historic religion, Old Testament Judaism. They, they abandoned the covenant of God with Moses. They abandoned it all, and they abandoned almost the entire Old Testament except for the first five books of Moses, and they make their own temple to worship. So they abandoned the temple in Jerusalem. They're heretics. See, by the time we get to the first century, and you read in the book of John when he says, and the Jews did not associate with Samaritans, you can realize that that is probably one of the greatest understatements in the New Testament. 
It was hopelessly broken. They hated each other. Jews don't just end up in Samaria. Yet what does God do through the faithful gospel ministry of Philip? Former deacon, remember? Acts chapter six. What does he do? God discloses his supreme pleasure in Philip's gospel preaching by delivering countless thousands of Samaritans from their afflictions, whether that be physical or spiritual, God delivers them and brings great joy to a city that was steeped in centuries of heresy and rebellion and evil and idolatry by the power of the Holy Spirit. God comes to his rebellious people. We're, we're gonna press more into that next week. We'll, we'll have to set that over on the side for now. Because as we turn to verse nine, the very first word in the verse tells us that there is more to the story. But. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when we're reading through narrative, we need to, we need to ask ourselves questions and the text questions along the way. Like, like, why do we all of a sudden have Simon show up in the narrative? Because, I mean, if you read carefully, Luke could have easily jumped from verse 8 to verse 12. From great joy in the city to a great number of people believing and being baptized. But, but, But he doesn't. He actually interrupts the story and introduces us to this new character, this curious man called Simon. He, he's a magician, and not, not like Houdini. No, no, he, he, he's a sorcerer. Yet he introduces him to us in a series of contrasts. Let me, let me highlight the contrasts that are in here. First, there's a contrast in the object of the crowd's attention. So, the, so we're seeing contrast between the crowd and Simon and Simon and Philip. In verse six, the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. Now notice, what, what's drawing the crowds to Philip? What's drawing their attention? It's a message of the gospel. The gospel is captivating. But if we turn to verse 11, we see that the only reason the crowd paid attention to Simon was what? His magic. It's his magic. With Philip, they're attracted to the message. With Simon, they're attracted to the magic. There's another contrast here, contrast in spiritual power. Whereas the crowds were amazed at Simon's magic in verse nine, we see Simon is amazed by Philip's miracles. That's important to note. Crowd's amazed by Simon's magic, but Simon is amazed by what? Philip's miracles. Again, he, he's a sorcerer. This is a dude that dealt in supernatural power long before he ever heard of Philip or the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what, what you see here in the text is that Simon instantly realized, he instantly realized that Philip's power was far superior to his power. He sees something that he's never seen or experienced. Finally, there's a contrast in the people's response. 
While early on when he introduces us to Simon, we're told that the people venerated Simon, saying that he had the power of God that is called great. Power is very important to this. What's the response to Philip? It's far greater. It's far greater. They believed Philip. They believed. And what was Philip teaching? He was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Not merely the power of God, but the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and how do they respond? They're baptized, both men and women. Philip isn't just somebody they look to for a good show, like Simon. They believe his message, believe, and they respond. They take the first step in discipleship, they're baptized to, to, to be identified with Jesus Christ, saying, I'm, I'm a Christian. And you know who also does it? Simon. Simon the magician, we're told, follows in the same path. So let's just stop for a second. In, 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 in a short number of verses, Luke has taken us from a great persecution to a monumental display of God's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The the very attacks that were directed towards the gospel's destruction didn't destroy the gospel, it didn't destroy the church, it didn't derail the people of God, no, it's resulted in the gospel's expansion into enemy territory. The rebels that turned their back on God centuries before in Samaria have repented of their sin and received forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And the demon-empowered magician who was believed to be the power of God that is called great has abandoned his life of magic for faith in the one true God. that's, That's what we see when we stop right here. So as you see, there's, there's a number of themes that Luke is bringing together here. But now we're coming to the climax of the story, starting in verse 18. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also so that, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could attain the gift of God with money. You neither have part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart might be forgiven you. For I see that you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Notice it's only at this this point of the story that we actually get a glimpse into Simon's heart. That's what we're getting here. And we can see Simon's true obsession with spiritual power. Simon is not a man who's compelled to humble worship when he sees the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out by the apostles on these Samaritan believers. We'll talk about that next week. No. What does he do? He instantly demands he demands his right to purchase the very same ability. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm using the word demand here because the Greek verb give here in verse 19 is not a question, it's a command. It's an imperative verb. Give it to me. I'll pay you anything you want. Give it to me. See, see, he thinks he's actually discovered the secret key to Philip's power and he's willing to do anything to attain it. That's what he wants. Yet what does Peter's rebuke tell us about Simon? What does Peter's rebuke tell us about Simon? 
Does, does it tell us that Simon was merely a confused baby Christian? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think his rebuke points us to the truth that Simon's profession of faith was never real to begin with. Simon's baptism was nothing more than getting wet. He was never really a Christian to begin with. That's what Peter's rebuke tells us. First of all, when, when, when Peter tells Simon that he has no part or lot in this matter, he's saying that Simon has no part or lot in Christianity or with the Holy Spirit. That, that's what he's saying. And, and if you read the text carefully, there's, there's, there's something notably missing in the text also. Simon never receives the Holy Spirit to begin with. We're, we're told that these other believers receive the Holy Spirit. What does Simon not receive? He doesn't receive the Holy Spirit. Second, when Peter tells Simon that his heart is not right with God and that he is enslaved to bitterness and iniquity, he, he's telling him that, that he hasn't been forgiven of his sin. His heart has not been made new, nor has he been freed from his slavery to sin. You've never experienced the work of God. Spiritually speaking, Simon's true condition before God has not changed. To use the terminology of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, he is dead in his sins. He is separated from God and he is destined for wrath. That's where Simon still is. Peter sees a truth in the condition of this man's heart. But maybe we can push back and say, why? I mean, why, why can Peter say something like this? I mean, I mean, after all, verse 13 tells us that he believed and he was baptized. Right? Well, the answer seems to be that Simon's so-called conversion was really driven by an ulterior motive. What did he want? He wanted to receive the power of God apart from the person of Jesus Christ. He, he wanted to receive the benefits of salvation apart from true repentance and faith in the saving Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wanted. So you see, the object of Simon's faith is not in the substitutionary death of Jesus, God's promised Christ and Messiah. That, that's not where his faith is. And, and the goal of his conversion is not forgiveness and restoration to God himself. It's the ability to have the kind of power that Philip has. See, to put it in pagan terms, he sees this as some sort of religious initiation. That, that's, that's, how, that's how he's viewing his, this, this conversion process. It's like any other religious initiation. You learn some things, you repeat some things, you go through a process, this one happens to be baptism, now you're part of the group, and now you're able to participate and do the things that they do. Simon is lost. He's not a Christian, and he's still destined for hell. But in all of this, Simon has not committed an unforgivable sin. Do you see that in your text? Simon has not committed an unforgivable sin. The blood of Jesus Christ is more than able to cleanse him of his sin and restore him to God so that he can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not off the table. It's not. He, what does he need to do? He needs to repent of his sinful attempt to abuse the gospel for his own ends. He needs to believe. That's what he needs to do. 
So Peter tells them to do, yes, yes, Simon can still become a Christian. But the sad truth of the matter is that for everything that we can tell from the text, he doesn't. On the one hand, Luke never records his repentance, and on the other hand, the entire tradition of the early church and the church fathers indicates that he continued in his error and perpetuated every manner of heresy like his fathers before him. Whereas they perverted the religion that they had received through God's covenant in the Old Testament, Simon perverted the new covenant gospel of Jesus Christ. So the story ends and he's lost. There's great joy in Samaria. There are a great number of of, of idol-worshiping pagans that have come to faith in Jesus. Simon is lost. It doesn't end with this super victory, does it? I mean, I mean, it's kind of depressing. It's, 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 it's it, it kind of reminds me of like Super Bowl Forty Nine. You know, the church weathers the blistering attacks of their persecutors. They, they start making steady gains for the gospel. The, the offense is actively taking new ground. It's putting gospel points on the board. But in the final moments of the game, the greatest gain, the greatest gain here, the conversion of a well-known magician proves to be as defeating and deflating as Russell Wilson's goal line pass. That's how this feels like it ends, Right? but we're supposed to feel this. We're supposed to see this. There's there's things that Luke wants us to understand in all this success of the gospel that we've seen. So let's ask the question, what is Luke's aim in this account? We see a couple of themes, but I think there's a primary aim clear themes that we do see and that we've touched on. Number one, we can clearly see the sovereignty of God in the evangelism of Samaria. In in that what the chief priest and the Sanhedrin and Saul himself intended to do and do for evil against the church, God is ultimately intended for good. It's evil. The persecution is wicked. It's sin. They are going to be judged for it. They intended it for evil, God intended it for good. Just like the whole story of Joseph. Another theme that we see in here is that everyday evangelism of the Christian refugees, we see this everyday evangelism, and it reminds us of something. It reminds us that effective evangelism does not require a single person to, to be in a position of, of influence or power to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Evangelism requires faithful gospel proclamation and reliance on the Holy Spirit. Second theme that we see, but I don't think those are the main points. Given that this account really reaches its, 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 its high point, its, its climax in Peter's rebuke of Simon, I think Luke's main aim in this section is to help his readers see that gospel success is not as cut and dried as, like we, as much as we'd like it to be. Gospel success, and we, make, we could put that in quotes, is not as cut and dried as we'd like it to be. What I mean by that and what we see in Simon is that sometimes people respond to the gospel in false belief, foolishly hoping they can receive the benefits of God apart from God himself. See, see, there's a truth that as the gospel goes out, as people respond, as countless, countless sinners find saving grace in the blood of Jesus Christ, 
and can be assured they're going to have everlasting joy in the future and in the present, the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, there are people that respond with a faith that is not true faith. And it's not that their faith isn't strong, as strong as the other people, but it's because they're trying to achieve something that the gospel does not promise or to receive it without truly coming to Jesus Christ. They want the power without the person. They want the benefits of God without God himself. See, for Simon, it's the pursuit of spiritual power, right? He wanted Philip's power, but he failed to realize that Philip's miracles were only there as pointers. They're there as pointers to something that was far more desirable. And that's God's offer of forgiveness and restoration in the person of Jesus Christ. Whether we're in the Gospels or in Acts or anywhere else, anytime miracles come into play in the New Testament, they are not the end. They are the means to pointing to the Gospel. That's why they're there. But the sad truth of the matter is that we we see this similar pursuit today. We see Simon's pursuit today. On the one hand, we see it overtly. We see it overtly in those who have bought into the promises of the prosperity gospel. I mean, I mean it's the same thing. They come to Jesus like this, this magical genie instead of a marvelous savior. That they're, they're hoping that their commitment to Jesus will not only secure their physical health and their financial prosperity, but ultimately they're hoping it's going to grant them ability and the power to speak their every wish into reality. Countless people, dead and lost in their sins, in massive churches, singing anthems to Christ who have never come to faith in Christ but are pursuing the privileges of Christ. And frankly, who in the end gets the prosperity? Who gets the prosperity? The smooth-talking, Rolex-wearing, modern-day Simons who pimp a perverted gospel to line their own pockets. That's who gets the prosperity. All those seeds of faith that are thrown in the offering plate each week serve only one purpose. The enrichment of the guy up front. That's what Simon wanted. Give this to me so that I can now go sell it to anyone. So that's the most crass way we see it. But it's not the only way that we see it. On the other hand, we see this pursuit in a far more subtle but more dangerous way. It's dangerous. We see this kind of pursuit happen in in people who witness the power of the Spirit in the life of the church. Let me explain what I mean. We, we have people there, they're unbelievers, and they see desirable things. They see the Spirit's delivering power. In the lives of God's people, they see the Spirit deliver people from every manner of long-standing substance abuse, eating disorders, and sexual addiction. That they see the Spirit's transformative power as he slowly converts once angry and bitter people into patient, humble peacemakers. And he turns selfish, self-serving people into open-hearted, generous givers. They see that kind of power at work inside of people. They, they see the Spirit's redeeming power as he rescues and he restores the most broken marriages and not only restores them, but he empowers this kind of love and tenderness in these families that overflows into a truly nurturing home that 
anybody in the world would love to have. And they see the Spirit's unifying power that binds a bunch of broken but saved sinners into this one body that we call the local church. And they see it. And they desperately want it. And they're not just wanting crass power like Philip. They're wanting truly good things. They want to experience the real life benefits of the Holy Spirit's power in their lives. The promise of victory, the promise of freedom, the promise of peace that surpasses all understanding. but instead of responding in humility to the gospel's call for repentance and faith. They attempt to attain it on their own through every manner of religious activity. Every manner of religious commitments that have zero ability to connect them to God's power or to to rescue them from their sin. I mean, it's a lot easier to throw a stack of 20s in the offering plate than turn your life over to Jesus in their minds. See, this, this, is, this is the warning we get from this text. And I know it's, it's a heavy message but it's the message of this passage. And and given that every word in our Bible is from God himself, it's a message that God wants his people of every generation to hear and understand and to apply. So let's ask the question, how can we apply this passage? How can we apply this warning as Christians to our everyday lives? It's one thing to point our finger at, at, at prosperity prophets. It's another thing to point our finger at people who are, who are trying to approach the power of God and receive the benefits of God in a faulty way. We need to identify them. We need to understand them and see them. But application begins with me. I have three. Number one. Whenever we encounter passages like this, we need to begin by honestly looking at ourselves and not others. And by this I mean that we need to inspect the foundations of our faith from time to time. And this this isn't meant to be, be saying, oh, everybody in here may not be a Christian, but it's saying it is good and it is healthy to inspect the foundations of our faith. Because it may very well be that Simon is self-deceived. He believes he's on the inside and he's really on the outside. And through my years in ministry, I've come across countless people who believe they're on the inside and they're really on the outside. So as we inspect our found, the foundations of our faith, it's good and it's healthy. Number one, it protects us from any form of unintentional self-deception or faulty gospel received in our youth. Because sometimes, that, that's often where it happens for somebody who's been in the church a long time. They hear a faulty gospel when they're nine and they're believing in that faulty, deficient gospel for the rest of their life. Believing that they've come to faith in Christ. Walking through all the motions, doing all the things, going on the mission trips when they never truly came to faith in Christ to begin with. But let me, let me point out the other benefit. Not only, not only unmasking self-deception as we hold it in light of the true gospel, but routine inspection can bolster our security in Christ. So, 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 so don't hear me like, oh gosh, I should be worried all the time. No, there, there's an inspection that actually boosts our security 
I mean, I mean, the homeowners, do we have routine inspections that we do on our house, right? I mean, before you buy a house, there's an inspection of the foundation, inspection of the roof, all sorts of other things. We want to make sure everything's in, in, in proper working order. And if it's not, there's a good chance we're not going to buy the house, unless they fix it. You're getting ready to go on a big trip across country. How many of you just jump in your car without any thought and put some gas in it and drive, and how many of you either inspect it yourself or take it in to get it looked over before you're going to go on a long trip? Looking it over before you go gives you assurance as you're on your trip that, hey, my car's in pretty good working order for everything we can tell. It's doing fine, and I don't have to be constantly worrying if something's going to break. So, so inspecting foundations is not purely negative. It can give us greater and greater and greater assurance. Number two. I think passages like this can help us better understand and counsel struggling Christians around us. Because it helps us understand that sometimes we might be talking to a Christian who's busy with all sorts of religious ministries, but as we begin to carefully listen to them, we realize that somehow they missed the real gospel along the way. Somehow they missed it along the way. And may, maybe their very experience and difficulties they're going through in the moment, please hear this rightly, are not a judgment of God, but a kindness of God. In that it's exposing they need Jesus to begin with. Why don't they feel the power and feel the joy? Why isn't it there? Maybe it wasn't there. That's not the answer every time, but sometimes we're talking long enough to somebody, it gets down to that point. And if it does, we need to realize it's a kindness of God to reveal it. Finally, I think passages like this, and especially this passage, should compel us as Christians to really sharpen our focus as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Really sharpen the gospel. What, what, what I mean by this is, is that while brokenness and pain often open up the door for gospel conversations, I mean, I mean, read any book on evangelism, right? And, and I mean, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find avenues to speak into somebody's life. We're not trying to be the guy with a megaphone outside the Mariners game screaming and yelling like, like we want to talk to somebody. And often, we, you know, it's finding how do I do it and often it's when things are going bad in their life. But we need to realize in our eagerness to share the gospel with our friend that the gospel does not promise that every Christian will have the power to fix all of our brokenness and meet our greatest unmet desires. The gospel doesn't promise that. It promises many things, but it doesn't promise there's always a fix. The promise of the gospel is that broken, rebellious sinners can be forgiven and forever restored to God, that they can be empowered, really, truly empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a life that brings God glory, no matter what's going on in their life, hard times, good times, no matter what's going on, be able to bring God glory through it all. and to be able to experience everlasting joy. That's the promise of the gospel. But it happens through one means and one means alone. It happens through repentance and faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved is the promise of the gospel. Let's close with a prayer.